Hi, welcome everyone to the monthly mentor panel, How to Get Promoted. I'd like you to introduce you to Steffi, Stacy Devino, our panel moderator and host for this evening. Thank you so much, Ali Melissa. <laughs> now I'm messing it up. Oh, oh, goodness. Well, I am so excited for our topic today on how to get promoted. We're going to dive deep and maybe get into things that are a little bit uncomfortable. And I want you to really take in, we have an incredibly diverse set of panelists from all different industries within technology, all different backgrounds and specializations. And so when we're talking, we are truly talking in broad strokes, ways that are effective in not just one place, but all places, or at least as much as we think they are. And with that, I'd love to start with Catherine Eclay. She is a visionary leader in user experience, technology, and creativity based right here in Dallas, Texas. With a career spanning over 17 years, she has amassed a diverse skill set that seamlessly blends her expertise in user experience, art, design, research, digital marketing, agile ways of working, product development, and cutting edge technology. Catherine's journey includes roles at prestigious organizations like St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, FedEx, and Topgolf showcasing her adaptability across corporate and nonprofit sectors. Catherine's ability to provide practical advice on advancement is rooted in her own multifaceted career trajectory, from starting out as an office assistant answering the phones to currently serving as vice president of strategy and design at Citibank. Drawing from her experience, Catherine shares her insights on navigating the path to advancement offering guidance on how to harness skills, seize opportunities, and cultivate a mindset of continuous growth. Thanks, Stacey. And next is Kayla Hayner. With a career spanning over a decade in the financial services technology sector, Kayla brings a wealth of experience, particularly in chief administration roles. She has been a driving force behind technology teams, contributing her expertise in engagement strategies, governance, and process optimization. Kayla's journey is characterized by her proficiency in steering cross-functional initiatives and enhancing organizational efficiency in collaboration with product and development teams. Originally an art student, she cultivated her skill set through hands-on experience and bringing in a creative, unique mindset, which has been pivotal in her success. At the forefront of her career, Kayla has taken the lead in conceptualizing and executing, <laughs> executing executive office priorities, streamlining processes, and devising effective action plans. Her reputation as an exceptionally organized professional is complemented by her prowess in technical product management. This skill not only allows her to deliver results with precision, but also empowers her to comprehend technical intricacies and communicate effectively. Kayla's dedication to excellence, combined with her diverse background and technical acumen, continues to drive her passion for innovation and success in the financial technology landscape. Noosh! <laughs> Noosh is an experienced, hands-on leader in retail that is super passionate about being kind. On a sunny day, you can find her outside with her husband and Dappy Dashound named Henrietta. She resides in Atlanta, Georgia and leads teams across the U.S., there is so much more to be said about Noosh, but I'm going to let her bring it up through all. I'm just like, oh man, that is like the most underrated. <laughs> like, um, But I am so excited for y'all to get to know each other today. So yay. Tia Likely. 
Tia Likely is a Senior Director of Customer Technology at The Home Depot, leading software engineering teams focused on building platforms and capabilities to enable great omni-channel experiences at the world's largest home improvement specialty real retailer. Tia is a passionate and proven leader who enjoys growing leaders to help solve challenging technology problems. She recently wrapped up a three-year tenure as co-chair for the Home Depot's Technology DE&I Council and is the leadership sponsor for our External Technology Apprenticeship Program, which seeks to find paths into technology careers for non-traditional candidates. In her free time, Tia is a big fan of Star Wars, specialty coffee, and most recently, Lego. She currently is based in Atlanta, Georgia, but can be found in the Dallas area where so many of her extended family members reside. And uh, just a little bit of a uh, thing here. Uh, Tia was my man, well, my boss's boss at one point in time. Um, and we definitely bonded over Star Wars and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to be here. I'm so glad to have everyone here. This is amazing. So with that kind of introduction and hopefully the sense of confidence and calm that came through uh, with that as well, can you tell us, each of you, a little bit about yourself and where you are currently in your career? Who wants to start? I'll go ahead and start. How about that? Um, my name is Catherine. As Stacy said, I'm really happy to be here um, just to kind of to chat with you all about obviously the topic. I'm currently working at Citibank. I'm based in Dallas and I work out of the office in Irving. And I, um, I supervise a team of designers for the mobile app and website for City. Awesome. I'll go next. Um, so I'm Kayla Heiner. I um, like Stacy said all the all the crazy words that um, <laughs> in the bio there. But um, I currently work at TIAA, which is a retirement company. Um, I'm located in the Frisco office, um, about 40 minutes away from that. I live in Lucas, so I have quite the commute. But um, if you're familiar with Texas at all, that's that's kind of how we like to do things out here. So. Um, but before that, I just recently switched roles in April, but before that, 10 years at Capital One, um, so in the financial service industry. Um, I have a daughter. She's 12. Um, so you may see her like run in here at any point in time because I told her mommy's on a call after six, but sometimes, you know, still even after COVID doesn't matter. She still comes running in here yelling about something. So apologies if that happens at any point. So I'm sure some of you can relate, but um, just super happy to be here with all these uh, talented, talented people we have here. I'm just amazed. Awesome. So I'll go next. My name is Tia Likely. Um, I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I actually moved back to Atlanta right after sort of COVID lockdown. I spent five years in the Dallas area, um, growing our Dallas Technology Center for the Home Depot. I'm, I just celebrated my 13th year. Um, so I support teams that are focused on what we call customer technology. So a lot of customer data, a lot of um, associate and customer facing applications. Um, and it's uh, it's been quite a, quite a ride um, and just really enjoying sort of settling into uh, the customer space. I, I spent nine years at Home Depot in the dot-com area. So a lot of focus on e-commerce and shifting over to customer was a little bit of a, a change for me, but a, a great opportunity and, and really helped me get to the next level. So looking forward to talk a little bit about that uh, in this session. Noosh, do you still have power? <laughs> I hope everything's okay. Um, well, uh, feel free to chime in when when things uh, kind of turn around. Um, 
so kind of continuing on to that are you someone who's currently responsible for promotions and if so how much scope are you fully responsible are you partially responsible are you cranking the numbers and deciding oh we don't have the budget this year right um what to what degree does any of that kind of fall into your uh purview you know i i uh I laughed when I saw this question come through because I personally don't have a team that I'm personally responsible for their uh, promotions like at Capital One. However, uh, being a chief of staff to the to the CTO and the division that I'm in, um, the 1,600 people that report into there, um, I influence that. Stacy, like you said, I sit there and I look at the budget and then this is what we have room for. This is what we don't. We balance talent and performance and all of those things kind of fall into my plate. Um, so it, it, it's stressful uh, to have all of that, but I directly influence those uh, promotion decis decisions and have a seat at the table when all the leadership team is, is talking through them. So um, while I directly um don't have people that report to me to make that decision. I still feel like the 1600 people are all underneath my wings and I'm personally responsible for them. So, um, but I, but I did love that question. I know for me, I have um, several direct reports on my team. And so I'm responsible definitely for um, doing reviews for them. Uh, making sure that they're they're personally and professionally growing and um, also the budget piece of it. So making sure, do we have budget this year to actually promote? Um, I work with my boss on that. Uh, so those are definitely all things that um, are in my purview at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, this was a, a really appropriate and, and timely question for me since we're in the process of um, what we call mid-year talent planning and, and calibration. So it's an opportunity for us as leaders to come together and talk about our associates and how folks are progressing and really looking at our organizational needs um, and seeing where there's opportunities where, where folks might um, get get promoted. And, and we recently promoted to staff engineers and to management positions, but a big part of that is talking about need for the company, right? We we look at, you know, the makeup and composition of a balanced team. We look at the makeup and composition of a leadership team and, and what are those roles and functions that that we need and, and does it make sense? Because there is a balance of sort of opportunity and, and readiness. Uh, so it's something that we take very, very seriously um, because it does impact, you know, directly the the team and the organization, but the company is as well. And, and it's just, it's something that we're kind of going through uh, right now in earnest, but those opportunities kind of happen over the course course of the year. And, and we just really want to make, make sure we're having the right conversations um, about po folks that may be ready for that, that next level. So can you tell us how you maybe got some of your most key promotions earlier in your career? I love this question. I had so many thoughts when I, I saw it. I have to say in the very beginning of my career, I took on a lot of things that I don't think I'd probably take on now um, just to get some experience under my belt. But at looking back, they were probably some of the things that made me laugh the most, made me cry the most, um, and really, really made me step out of my comfort zone and focus more on skill building than it was on like climbing the ladder or getting getting to the next position. It was more about around like the knowledge and the training and building building my knowledge and being able to take that to the next level when I was ready to do that. Yeah, I would um, 
And I'll kind of piggyback off of that. I think that there's always an aspect um, like early on in your career and even as you grow is like, what is your competitive edge? Um, how does that set you apart from, you know, other people that are in your field, whether that's internal to your company or even external? I think that's huge. Early on in my career, I was called a project manager and that's like what they called you when they didn't really know what to call you. They just said, okay, this is what you are, but you did everything. Um, but when you really think about that, like what sets me apart if I have to explain that role externally? Um, somebody asked me that early on. I was like, uh, I have no idea. I'm a project manager. They're like, well, what does that mean? So um, I think really think about what your competitive edge is um, always, regardless of where you're at in your career, whether you're just starting or, you know, whether you've been here for 15, you know, plus years, like there's still that competitive edge value. I would also say, um, you know, when I think about the first one or two promotions that I had, it was kind of understanding the next level and like, what does good look like there? And not necessarily doing everything um, at that next level, but what are some of those competencies or skills that people are looking for? And can I demonstrate that? Uh, and I think it, it goes along with with what um, uh, Kayla kind of said is, it's it's not necessarily just good enough to do your job as is, but can you extend yourself? Can you, can you, you know, kind of, like I said, demonstrate some of those competencies, stretch yourself, you know, be willing to, to learn and maybe put in a little bit of extra effort and, and work um, to demonstrate that, Hey, yeah, yeah, I can, I can do that. So uh, how is this different from how you prepare yourself now for promotion, especially in looking back, um, I think that it's the higher you go, the more it's very specific. Yeah. And it has to, and the preparation is deliberate. Yeah. Uh, not doing the work, but making sure. <laughs> Um, and, you know, can you give some pointers of how, how that is significantly different in this part of your career versus, you know, what it was, especially in those first few promotions? I think for me, by, by far the biggest thing is understanding the business that we're in, um, understanding our business strategy, our goals, our industry, our challenges, um, and being invested in that, um, having a seat at the table and being able to look at all those things through a technology lens, um, really investing that time to really understanding um, a financial statement, like really getting, um, just really being able to have those conversations with our business partners, our stakeholders, um, shareholders, customers, to talk about what we're trying to achieve and not just the technology, right? That was truly eye-opening. And, you know, even now um, I've been in a new role for, for I think I just hit two years, but it's really investing that time into understanding what are we trying to accomplish, right? And how can I impact that? And not just, hey, what technologies are we trying to leverage? Um, really, I think really important as you kind of progress in your career. Yeah, I like the... Um the thought leadership changes as you grow, right? Um, I think that there's an also, there's a point, uh, Catherine kind of touched on this as well, where you almost say yes to everything early on in your career because you're trying to build this skill set and do all of these things and prove yourself, right? Um, as you grow in your career and prepare for promotions later on, that actually hurts you saying yes to everything. And I've gotten the feedback before many times where it's, do you say no? It's okay to say no, you should say no. So I think that that's also a transition from early on, I have to prove myself and do everything um, to actually, no, I have proven myself now let me, you know, kind of pass it and delegate. I know there was a question in the chat about kind of that IC or management chain. And that's 
that's definitely one as you transition from IC to management is, Kayla, you're saying yes to absolutely everything, but you have a team of, you know, five plus people that actually can do all of those things and you need to delegate. I would say that's a big transition. It was at least for me. Yeah, and all great points um, from both of you. I I want to add just a few things just based on what I've learned. You know, starting out in my career, like Stacy mentioned, you know, I, I answered phones. I was a receptionist. I was an administrative assistant. I moved into management. I, and then I just built from there. And you do say yes to a lot of things to also explore what you like and what you don't like and what you think you might want to continue doing and what you don't want to do. And I think that's part of the building the maturity and the knowledge so that you can get to a point where you're like, oh, okay, I, I don't want to be an individual contributor anymore. I'm really interested in mentoring. I'm really interested in leadership. I really want to be at that strategy level. And I think, you know, that's that's the division to a certain degree between, um, you know, individual roles versus the leadership track is, are you interested in strategy? Are you interested in looking at the whole picture? Or do you just want to do a particular thing? And you're good with that. Um, I do want to mention also a couple of things, too, is I would really encourage all of you if you're not already, be an amazing communicator because that really sets you apart um, as a leader for any role that you have. If you can't communicate, it's gonna be really hard to connect with people that you work with and even in your personal life. So I, I feel like what we do in our professional, it's also in personal and vice versa. The other thing I would say is, as you're learning and you're growing and you're maturing in your career, build your brand. To me, that is so, so vital and important. Value yourself, value your time. That doesn't mean you have to have a major ego. You know, it just means that you're, you're, you are educated, you're learning, you're curious, you're trained, you have a skill set. Value that about yourself because no one else will value that for you unless you, you show people. So to me, that's really important. You know, have a great resume. Um, make sure you explore lots of different things. Take advantage of training. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but I'll time box myself. <laughs> well, and I, I wanted to highlight, we've had some questions in the chat about like picking between IC and management and um, looking to transition. We actually have some really awesome recordings from two sessions that we had recently on the path of engineer to manager and the path of the staff plus engineer. And uh, just so that you can really understand some of the things that are intrinsically different and just how much they are very similar uh, in terms of overall scale and scope, depending on organization. So um, I do encourage everyone absolutely to take uh, take that into into account with uh, some of the questioning, and yeah, please do still ask your questions, and we'll try to include them as well. And you know, kind of the thing that stuck out is talking about interlaying business acumen with technical realities and understanding the value of what you bring to the job and what you're trying to accomplish. In lack of, uh, you know, kind of better wording, uh, those dollar dollar bills, y'all. Um, <laughs> right? Um, you know, what decisions you make, how does it affect the bottom line? And how did you personally develop those skills and, you know, kind of bump up on that business acumen side in order to be better prepared to talk to stakeholders, to be better prepared to come into those meetings with, you know, whatever your background was in design or making the product and how what you were doing is going to affect the product. I think 
I think this one, this one's a complicated question, right? Because you can, you can go at it several different ways, but um, just transitioning into a new company, a new role earlier this year, um, coming in kind of in that, that leadership role, learning a company, I had no idea what they were doing or the product line that they were going after. Um, so I'll hit it from that direction of like coming in new and learning the business part is you have to spend the time to go in deep. Um, because if you don't, then you're only going to stay surface level and just kind of hit on these little points, but spend the time, go in deep, do your homework. Um, I spent hours going, uh, and learning leadership styles, the leaders that I was going to work with. And, and once you kind of can tell, um, certain, um, I would say characteristics of your leaders too, then you can tend to know the direction that they're leaning to go in decisions and be able to help them. Um, that's personally what I do in my career every single day. Um, so that's super important, a skill set to have. Now, as far as, um, you know, on the business side, it comes a little harder being, um, you know, the way that our organization is structured, the business, you know, is separate from, from tech. And I think that's how a lot of corporations, you know, are structured. It makes it a little hard of how do I really get close with my business partners to understand what their roadmap is and how we're affecting it. And, and again, it's, it's going in deep and doing your homework and spending the time to learn it is super important up front. Um, Cause then, like I said, you're own, then you're only going to be surface level if you don't. One of my favorite things, um, so, you know, obviously Home Depot, retail, um, but when I really want to understand the business, I throw on an apron and go into a store. <laughs> and that is frightening because I don't know how to do anything, but you get a good sense of the customers and you get to meet them where they are. And you get to see them use the software that your team builds and you get to understand whether it's resonating with them or not. And it's a, it's a very small sliver and slice um, of, a, of a large company, but it gives you an opportunity to get a little closer to the people who are really impacting the business and the company. Um, and so, you know, it's just really just reiterating um, what Kayla said is just, get in the thick of it, um, get where your customers are, understand what the challenges are and, and trace it back, right? And when you start to get a better sense of that, that can help inform your thinking and some of the decision-making that happens as a leader in technology. And you quickly learn that, hey, you know what? Sometimes the best decisions that you make aren't the funnest or the sexiest, but they're meaningful for your company and what you're trying to achieve. Because the technology is always going to be fun. It's always going to be exciting. It's always changing. You always want to try to do the latest thing. But when you can view technology problems through that business lens, you know, sometimes it's, it is saying no. Sometimes it is spending, you know, that investment in remediating tech debt or whatever. Um, so for me, it, it, when, when you kind of get in those situations where you're, you you're feeling a little distant from what you're trying to achieve, go into a store, do a ride along with an outside sales rep, go visit a distribution center. Um, it's a, it's a huge kind of reality check. Just really kind of get into the thick of, thick of things. Now, now this weekend, I'm going to go into a Home Depot and tell my husband, Tia said, I can grab an apron uh -oh. and go for <laughs> it. So I look forward to that. It is the hardest job. <laughs> yes. yes. I'll bet that's a whole new perspective. Um, I just, just to build off what, what both of you just said, I, I thought of different things as you were talking. And one thing that I would give as a tip is, take time to be prepared to have a conversation. So for example, if you know you're gonna have a particular meeting the next day, don't wait to get into that meeting to figure out what you're gonna say, prepare beforehand. That prep 
will make a world of difference in your conversations with stakeholders or design partners or you know developers or whoever you're involved with and leadership as well. And so you will have a reputation as you've come prepared. There is a purpose to this call and it's not just everybody getting together, just having a conversation and nothing comes out of that call because everybody hates to waste time. Um, the other thing that I would say is try, especially as women, try really hard to take emotion out of the work day. That doesn't mean you can't go home and vent or talk to friends or coworkers, but I have found over the years, 20 something years, that you can really hurt your reputation if you talk about other people and if you are emotional, meaning you fly off the handle if you don't get along with somebody. So try really hard to just focus on the business aspect of it and leave the emotion in check. I'm so glad that Noosh is back. Yay, Noosh. Hi, I, everyone. I would love to hear. <laughs> Hi. First of all, please accept my Hello. profuse apologies. Um, I'm literally got on the call 30 minutes early. I saw Catherine on there. I was like, okay, I've got this. I even put lipstick on. And then I guess the frame never refreshed. And I was like, okay, how? Like, when is this thing supposed to start? And I was chatting in the chat. So anyways. I apologize. Profuse apologies. No disrespect, Matt. And, and hi, Tia and Stacy. I miss you guys. Well, um, what we were kind of just talking about was really like bringing in that business acumen and what are some of the kind of like pointers that you found to really elevate yourself and differentiate yourself for promotion um, at each cycle. Got you. Um, let me see. I'm 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 trying to align this. So I did come prepared. I made notes on all the questions that were sent prior. <laughs> so which question number was this? I think it was uh, number six. Was that it? No. Um, it, it's it's fine. We can kind of just uh, we can we can go to number six because that's kind of where we're where we're headed on this train because okay. really it's. <laughs> The next, the next question is really around deciding who's ready for promotion and how do you help your subordinates get into a position to be ready for promotion if they're not already there, if there's something, something missing, because it's, you know, it's not about having uh, all five, you know, like if you've got four fives and one, two, it ain't going to work out, right? <laughs> but if you got... You got, you know, mostly fours and one three. It's fine, right? Like, yeah. um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, just to give people a little bit of scale there, like, so what, what are you with your subordinates to really make those things happen? Um, well, going back to the business part of it, I think I, I also agree with Tia, like putting on that apron or that badge. Like if you're, I'm in retail as well. I'm at Kohl's. And so, and I also am in the same space that I've always loved, which is the store space, or but even if you're in the customer space, like putting yourself and whoever your end user's uh, shoes are, right? I think gaining empathy is huge for identifying ways that you can improve their life and experiences. Um, added to that, um, I think for, for me and my team, um, growth is a it's huge. It's the number one thing that we talk about on a weekly basis. Every one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, okay, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. How are you doing this week? And then we get into, okay, what do you need my help with? Do you need classes? Do you need, what did you learn? Do you need me to connect you with something? That being said, I think the first step is really identifying the desire for that growth first, right? Like some people are happy with where they're at. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we don't celebrate and reward these contributors, but if they don't want to be promoted, then don't force them. Um, definitely, I would say um, helping them map out activities and responsibilities that can get them there is key to helping someone get promoted. Um, and I would say most importantly, when you're having these conversations with someone, don't forget to let their strengths shine. 
Um, I really believe that so many leaders focus on the pieces that need improvement. Um, and so I just want to shout out for, you know, all the sunshine, rainbows, kittens in the house. Just don't forget to highlight and share your team members' strengths. Now, you're probably like, well, how would you do this? For me, um, if they're a subject matter in something, right, if they're the Figma expert, if they're, you know, for, for most of the majority of this audience are developers, we've got dev mode now, right? Um, if, if you've got people leaning in on how to collaborate with different peers, balance different members of the balance stool on your team, whether it be product manager, design, or whatever, just leaning in and helping kind of use your subject matter expertise uh, and sharing that. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll make it really quick. There's, there is a germ of proactiveness required here. A lot of people say, you know, like basically like leaders can't just give you a checklist. You have to be proactive about what you're wanting to do and, and really open, honest communication with your leader into figuring out um, how you can get there. Uh, gaining mentors. Tia was one of mine the first day I was at Home Depot, gosh, seven years ago, Tia. Um, and I actually had the the lovely pleasure of going to Austin and meeting a lot of people out there, including Stacy as well, um, seeking advice. And then that continual growth for feedback is key. Don't wait for your don't wait for your boss or your leader to get a 360 on you. Don't wait, don't wait for mid year reviews. Like constantly get that feedback with your your teammates and your stakeholders. Go grab a coffee. Go grab a virtual coffee. Um, I think that's probably the biggest way that. I would advise people to get that promotion. I'll pass it to Tia. Um, so yeah, I think one of the big things um, is being clear on what the expectations are. Um, and then also wrapping your head around, um, you know, what good looks like and, and good can look a lot of different ways. Um, I think one of the things that we struggled with, um, you know, especially several years ago, was a very narrow view of, hey, readiness um, for that next level. And right, you had to look this certain way and demonstrate just these narrow things in order to get promoted, right? And like one of the things that I I, I know I mentor and coach a lot of engineers on is this perception that. You have to be an extrovert or whatever, you know, to be able to get to the next level. Um, and it's not about being talky or being loud or whatever their perception is, but can you get your point across? Can you get your voice heard? Like that's most important. Like, have you developed that, that skill? Um, and so for me, it's, it's really having that conversation um, of, hey, this is what our company defines as the things needed for that next level. How do you measure uh, against that? Um, but also a facet of, hey, you know, good can look, um, you can be, you know, a, a best in class in these three things, like to Stacy's point, and, 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 you know, meet expectations on these other things that may be promotable, right? You don't have to be best in class in, in everything. And really, you know, to Nisha's point is, is really highlight those strengths. Don't hyper-focus on negatives. I've seen some, you know, associates just get submarined by one interaction from somebody seven months ago, <laughs> right? And how do you kind of help them get, get past that? So, Really, like I like I mentioned early on, it's it's that readiness and and are you helping um, folks get prepared for that? Um, and can they consistently demonstrate that? And it's not just the one time I did this thing, um, but can you consistently demonstrate that competency or that uh, ability? And and then of course, another area where I see I see people kind of get stuck is in the interview process, right? Um, and as Catherine mentioned, like that communication, that storytelling, um, can you speak about, you know, what you bring to the table um, and, you know, the value prop, uh, the value add um, that you would have in that, that new role, all those things have to come, 
have to come together. Um, and then when folks kind of fall apart on any one of those things, are you focusing your development and attention and improvement in any of those other areas? Yeah, all of all really awesome points. Um, and again, I love hearing everybody talk because it just uh, in my mind, I'm like, pure, pure, pure. I have all these thoughts just rattle off in my head. I a, a couple of things that I would add to that is be patient. Don't expect a promotion overnight. It takes time to build a reputation within a company. So work towards building that reputation and be open to feedback. So for example, ask your boss when you have one-on-ones or um, anybody, it can be any of the leaders or any anybody in the company, you know, hey, um, is there anything that I, I can do more of? Is there something that I can do better? You know, any ways that I can improve? The fact that you're proactively asking shows to me leadership, that you're willing to communicate, you're willing to grow, you're willing to learn. Um, the other thing is ask for responsibility. So if you, you know, if you want to do certain things, don't be afraid to ask. So go ahead and say, Hey, you know, I'm really interested in doing this and this. Um, is there an opportunity to do that? And then also dress for the part. So I always say, again, building your brand, right? So if you want to be a manager, if you want to be a director or a senior VP or CEO, you know, the only person stopping you is you. So dress for the part, um, be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what those roles entail and start working towards those things. And I know we'll get to it, but I, I'm sure there's probably someone out there because I have been in these types of sessions before. Um, and you're like, well, you know, what happens if there are budget constraints? What happens if they're not promoting? Mm -hmm. What happens if this or, you know, all these things that you can't control and hopefully we'll get a chance. I'll, I'll loop back around to that with some tips. <laughs> we are totally going to get to that, Catherine. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, and especially also, I wanted to kind of like bump up on one of those little parts at the end that you said of like dress for the part um and look the part nobody's saying that you need to go and become like uh, a really girly girl or really you know anything you you can be 100 percent yourself but look clean look prepared wear something that is appropriate even if you are working fully remote i do my hair every day i do my <laughs> makeup every day what you don't know is I totally have Ugg slippers on right now. <laughs> um, That's funny. Right? Like, uh, but you look from here up so amazing, Stacey, that oh, you're amazing. comfortable. <laughs> but you don't know is this is a, like a knit top that is just so squishy and, and perfect. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a, um, it is perception is reality. And, you never want there to be a reason why somebody says no, even if they don't know what the reason is. There are so many feels with promotions as like kind of a weird situation. Um, just put yourself in a really good place to make, to make and deliver consistently on what you are already doing. Um, so with that... Now it's time for what I'm going to go ahead and say is the disclosure, which is <laughs> we are about to talk some office politics, y'all. So any talk of office politics is generic and it is not a discussion of any specific company culture. And to this is the disclosure, banners up, whatever that means. Um, Thank you, girl. Swear, ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is, these are experiences and so, and I can also say from my own experience that um, so many things hold true regardless of where you work. And to a large portion, we're going to get into the specifics of how some of those politics play into your ability to get promoted 
and your boss's ability to promote you. So um, <laughs> the first kind of easy question here is how important is company alignment versus overall performance in being able to either promote someone or become promoted yourself? To me, this this is this question and the rest of them really, really, um, I have lived these things. And um, I would say for this one, it, it is a, a, a fine line. It is a ballet that you have to balance. And sometimes you go to work and you really don't want to balance it, you know, and maybe that's a day where you take a long lunch. Um, but I think it goes back to, for me, it goes back to the point I made earlier about being able to separate out emotion from what you're doing. You're there to do a job. You're there to be productive. You're there to be efficient and to be effective and to shine light on everybody that you work with and to be a good team member, to be a good leader. And I think that if you stay focused on those things, everything else falls into place. You know, you're communicating with your boss. What are the goals of the company? What are my goals? And then you're, you know, you're, you're getting along with people. You're being prepared for meetings. So I think that it's a fine balance. You know, you want to be a great performer um, and you want to align with the company goals, but then, and I'm sure someone probably has already thought this in their head and hopefully we'll get, we'll get to this at some point, but you, it reminds me of the yearly reviews um, and the mid-year reviews. And I don't know about you all, but um, I really don't put a lot of stock in those. I, I look at, you know, how someone's performing and I focus less on what's being written out in a performance review. Because what I see throughout the year, your performance shows me whether or not you're aligned to the company goals or not. So um, that's that's just my experience. Kayla, Tia, I, Noosh, I don't know what you, you all have to say about that. I, I literally, that was one of the first words I wrote after this question. It was like, it's, a, it's definitely a balance. Balance is key. Like the question again was how important is it to, to align with company alignment versus overall performance, right? Um, and the reason I say it's a balance, I think you're always doing both. That being said, depending on your level, you'll be doing one more than the other. So what do I mean by that? Um, for, for me, the more junior, I'm really looking for overall performance, which to me equates to their tactical impact to their balanced teams. Whereas the more senior you are, I'm looking for company alignment to their balanced team as well as their cross silo, cross team, cross company initiatives. And that I equate with their strategical impact. And for those wanting promotions, it's that drive to connect the two, the tactical with the strategic, the company alignment with the overall performance. And going back to, we were talking about, I think Stacy was like, you know, or I'm not sure who it was, but it was like, don't wait for permission, ask. If you want the responsibility of a senior and you're not a senior, a lot of times you got to do it before you get it, right? We've all heard that. Um, and those are some small ways that you can kind of get from that that tactical junior level to a more strategic senior level. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. You know, and at, at one point in my career, uh, the advice that I got is, you know, depending on how your company does it is they look, you know, your leaders are looking for feedback. They don't just want their feedback and their opinion, like they're looking for it across. So Noosh, I think you said this too, is like really that cross-functional and who is your cheerleader and who is advocating for you? And, um, and that also, that that's a good balance between the two, right? Um, if you're performing well, then your peers know about it. If you're performing well, your leadership knows about it. And then if you're doing that overall cross-functional alignment across, then then everyone's going like, yeah, Stacy, let's do this. Like, you know, what's 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 holding us back? Let's do it. So um, 
I think you really have to make sure that you're creating those advocates always, not just, oh, this year I'm getting promoted. So let me go do that thing. Like, how are you always creating those advocates? And um, one of my uh, executives that I worked with a couple of years back, he told me some advice that I will never forget. He said, at any given time, you were always influencing at least five people, always, even getting gas in your car, like someone, yeah. there's a little kid in a back seat that's watching you and you're doing that thing. So if you're frustrated and you're mad, you're influencing the way that person is seeing you. So um, at any given time, you're influencing five people. So just think about kind of um, how you're creating those advocates with your influence, with the work and your performance. That's a really great point, Kayla. I think the part that really stood out to me is and earlier on in my career, the best advice I ever got was that you got to toot your own horn. And no matter how my ego is, if I'm, if I think I'm great or not, I always was very like hesitant to be like, oh, look what I did, right? But the advice they gave me was that people won't know what you, what you're, what you're doing unless until you tell them, right? So it's not really bragging as long as you say it with humility. Um, and you've, you've got to basically be that self-advocate as well. Definitely find an advocate and a leader and mentor and partners. But if you're not being your own cheerleader, then that's probably the first place I would start. Like be your own cheerleader. Rah. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Sorry, the self-advocacy. I think that is well put is that it's not about the ego. It's not about, hey, I did. I can do this. I can do that which, you know, sometimes we can fall into that trap, you know, yeah. and I know I've been there where I'm like, oh, you know, I want to get that promotion. I'm going to tell them everything that I do. Great. You know, <laughs> and then it's, it, you don't build a good reputation that way. So, but self-advocacy is like, hey, you know, if you want me, I can help you with this, or I, you know, I've learned how to do this. I can do that in a humble way, I think is an awesome, awesome point. And I actually want to bring out one little piece, which is sometimes that can be your frying pan. And if you're familiar with PUBG, there's a particular, you can get a frying pan. And what does it do? It covers your butt. <laughs> um, because you can have, you can have leadership that isn't great sometimes. And by having your work known with your name attached, and it's, there is nothing wrong with adding more names to the end of your list. There is <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Um, thank as many people as you can. Um, but I personally have had a few times where, um, and, you know, a couple of notable ones where uh, my manager tried to put something, some significant project that I had not just founded, but done all of the work around and led multiple groups in order to do as the work of somebody else in order to either get that person hired on full time or um or in one case to get them promoted um so but he brought it up in the meeting oh. <laughs> uh, or in one of these cases um and uh was promptly shut down so um <laughs> Go ahead, Noosh. <laughs> I think good, good for you. I would say this is a great segue into the question that um, was asked is what is the most unfortunate reality of promotions that you didn't know until it was a responsibility? Um, not all leaders are created the same. Um, a perfect example of what just Stacy said, right? Um, not being the credit where credit's, not being given the credit where credit's due. I'll give you a, a personal example from, from my life. Um, I'm very energetic and bubbly. If you haven't figured that out yet, I love to talk and I can keep talking forever. Um, and I had one leader give me feedback that they loved my energy and told me never to change. But then right after they said they would never trust me in a board room with boardroom with executives. And that the immature version of myself could not decipher what that meant. They really, what I learned looking back res retrospectively is they never really helped me correlate the soft skills needed to communicate at that level to their concern over my personality traits. Um, and I actually took it as a personal affront. It took me years to figure this out. Um, it's only 
recently that I truly realized that sometimes you'll have leaders that will help you amplify your strengths. Then those that will try to shape you into their definition of strength. And that's where you got to really be true to yourself and figure out what it is you really want. Um, there's this book that I read and I'll kind of tell you guys, it's basically don't take the feedback personally. That's probably my biggest thing. You can, you can learn from your leaders. You can take their feedback, but it's not always just because they're your leader doesn't mean that they don't have growth opportunities as well. Um, and if the feedback doesn't make sense or if it makes you feel attacked or in Stacy's world, if they try to you know, take credit for everything you've done, then take a breath and turn around and ask them. Right. Um, now, obviously this assumes trust and that's, we can talk about that later, but um, the book that I was talking about is called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. If you guys have heard about it, it's a really short book. Like I said, I'm an art school kid, so I don't like to read at least not stuff that teaches me stuff. <laughs> I like romance novels, but that's too much information. Um, but basically, the four principles are try your best, never take anything personally, never assume and be impeccable with your word. I'll, I'll leave it that. Actually, I'll pick I'll, I'll send it over to Kayla and uh, see if you got any rebuttal on that. I know that was a lot. No, I was like, oh, I love all the art background in this with Catherine and yourself. And I'm I'm having art background. So I was like, oh, this is fantastic. Um, but no, I think I think it um you hit on a couple of things, which is like do not measure yourself with other standards, but there is um and and I'll and I'll put a little asterisk in that, which is make sure though that you understand expectations of your role. I've been I've been in an instance where, you know, you're doing the role, you're performing. I wasn't asking for consistent feedback all the time. Always, always ask. Every week now when I meet with my manager, I'm like, do you have any feedback for me? Even if they say no, but it just opens up that opportunity. Because I've had it in the past where I didn't do that because I was almost afraid to of like, oh my goodness, what are they going to say? Um, but then it came to review time and the expectations that were laid out were not what I thought. Um, so just make sure that you're constantly opening up that avenue for feedback and transparency if they're not opening it up for you. Um, so that's that's kind of my biggest thing is... Um, just make sure you're constantly opening that and and being being true to yourself and understanding the expectations of your role very clearly. Um, so I I did want to touch on that. And I know Noosh, you said always ask questions, make sure it's super clear. I I'd, I'd love yeah. actually love to expound on that in, in terms of feedback because one of the things I've encountered a ton of is um, people reluctant to give you constructive feedback for what, whatever reason. And so I can absolutely ask for it, but never or rarely got anything meaningful. If I just asked, Hey, do you have any feedback for me? Um, so one of the tactics that I, I had to employ was really be very specific, um, and try to be also timely. It's like, Hey, you know, any feedback on that presentation I gave in that meeting? Or, hey, what did you think about, you know, the whatever design decision we made to go do blah, 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 blah. Um, and sometimes another uh, thing you can do is sort of, you know, prep for a future conversation and say, hey, boss, um, in our next 101, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on how we might approach A, B, C, X, Y, Z a little bit differently, kind of felt maybe it didn't resonate with the team, wanted to see if you had any thoughts, looking forward to our conversation. So you're not trying to put someone on the spot to come up with their their point of view, you know, cue up that conversation. Um, so if you're finding that you're not really getting meaningful feedback and what you're seeing in your mid-year or end of year doesn't sync up with kind of what you think, um, how you're performing, you know, that's another couple little tactics that you can leverage to try to suss out some, some meaningful perspective from folks. That's very true, Tia. I want to piggyback on that and say, um, I found that with different communication styles and work styles, having a lot of people are scared to even ask their best friend, even 
like what their opinion of their presentation was or whatever. So one of the things that can help depending on the, the dynamics of the person you're talking with is I've created a cheat sheet like Google form that has a few basic questions that I use in a 360 every quarter. And it's like, and then we, we usually add to that and we've created it where it's an anonymous form that they can just send out to all their leaders and stakeholders and peers and be like, hey, can you give me feedback? All the feedback is anonymized and we're just looking for opportunities of growth. Um, so that's another way of being able to, to get over that hurdle of, I mean, they're really hard conversations, you know, and even, don't get me wrong, feed, growing and feedback, I'm making it sound like all the feedback you're going to get is, is poor. That's not truth. You're going to get amazing feedback, right? Um, but with everything positive, there's definitely that opportunity for growth. And I think just building that trust, having those conversations and getting that continual feedback is definitely just key to anybody's success, whether it's at work or even your home, you know? Did you have anything to add, Kayla, to that one? Yeah, go ahead. Stacy. go ahead. No, no. Finish, finish. No, no, I was just trying to figure out who to send it to so there wasn't a pause. Oh, oh okay. Um, so I kind of want to move us to number 13 officially, which is what are, what is like the most unfortunate reality of promotions that you didn't know until it was your responsibility? Um, I think that we've talked about uh, some of these things where you maybe you you don't necessarily have always the most prepared and passionate leaders. Um, uh, everyone of our panelists here, you know, has demonstrated leadership in multiple capacities and multiple leadership positions. So this is uh, kind of you've looked at your peerage at multiple levels and gone. Ooh, uh, or a little bit of, oh, ooh, I need to do that. Um, but mostly in this one is, yikes. What what are some of the most unfortunate realities? I definitely have a few. Um, being on the, the non-promoted side and then being on the promoted side, you see a lot of the same things, but in a different way different limbs. So I think everybody's probably run into this issue. Let's say you work at a company for a year, you think you're doing a great job, you go in, do the performance review, and you're you're like, hey, you know, when when can I get promoted? And they're like, well, you know, we really need to set some, you know, goals for you. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. Um, and then you're like, okay, well, I feel like I've I've achieved all these goals. And now what, you know, and it's two years or it's three years or whatever it might be. And um, it's a, it's budget constraints or it's um, well, you know, I just, you can keep having the same conversation over and over and over again. And um, I think it can be very frustrating. And so I always think of the song, I don't know if anybody knows the song, but it's like no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one to walk away, no one to Kenny run. Rogers. Yes, Kenny Rogers. you do know. <laughs> yeah, I so, do. <laughs> you know, to me, it's how long, how much do you want to invest in your role before you say, okay, I'm moving on to someone who will value me. Um, and I know from personal experience, there, I have worked for companies where I've given it, and I, th I think you have to be patient too. You can't go in and say, okay, after three months, when are you going to promote me, right? They need time to evaluate you. And Anna, I think you posted this question. It's like, how do you ask for a promotion? I think it's also when you ask for it. So have you demonstrated for a, a full year? That's what I look for in people now is have you demonstrated within a full year you know, that you, you've tried to do a lot of things to prepare yourself for a, a new role. Um, and I don't think you should be afraid to ask by the time that year is up and say, hey, you know, can we talk about promotion opportunities? But I think you need to talk about it even before that and say, you know, I'm starting this role. Here's my professional 
you know, career, career path that I'm envisioning, how can we align? And then towards the end of that year, you talk to someone and say, your boss and say, hey, you know, how, where am I right now? Are we looking at, you know, potentially an opportunity for promotion or is it more growth or whatever it might be? And I think at that point you say, okay, based on the feedback I get now, what is my next step? Do I stay at this company? and invest more or is this never going anywhere and now it's time to take take my experience thank you very much build my resume and start applying for roles that i wanted that i didn't get at this company and you start shopping right and you start saying i value myself enough that even if no one at the company does for whatever reason whether it's budget or you know anything else and then you take that experience and you move on, say, thank you. I really appreciate it. And you leave on a good note and you move on to the next level. And, you know, whether that's more pay or, or a better title or both. So to me, that's, that's been my experience. Yeah, I think, um, and I know this wasn't part of the question, but just to kind of piggyback, I think it's don't be afraid to know your worth and be able to take those leaps um, that Catherine was just talking about too. I'm one, I can talk about it, you know, most recent experience in the last five months, like um, after 10 years of experience at the same company, it is so scary, like so scary, um, but don't be afraid. So reach out to me personally, happy to share, share my experience on that. But I know that wasn't part of the question, Stacy. This would definitely be a different conversation if we were in person. With <laughs> <my friends. laughs> okay. um, I'll add to that. Sometimes the fact of the matter is that your communication style might be different than their communication style, which might be different than your leader, your boss's boss, both of your boss's boss's communication style. And then what happens is you have a performer that thinking that they're outperforming everyone and they're getting a promotion in six months but in reality you're the with their day-to-day -day. so a lot of it too is just some transparency not just between you and your leader but you and your leader's leader um up and down both ways I mean it's it's yeah I know where to really go with that okay I'll see TLDR <laughs> oh, no on. like just kind of the TLDR is sweat equity is a lie right yeah, it is a lie. <laughs> I would love to hear you explain what you mean by that. I, I heard when you said that I had a whole image explode in my head. <laughs> so I, I know what I think you meant, but what did you mean by that, Stacey? <laughs> that being the highest performer, being whatever that is, is not the thing that's going to make you be promoted. You think that it's about putting together a portfolio that makes you undeniable. Nobody ever said, asked somebody to marry them because they had all of the qualifications met. Right? You meet the, the qualifications. Once they're met, they're met. Right? But there, there is a certain amount of relationship building and falling in love and having a good understanding and and all of these things that help you enact better as to what you are trying to accomplish and so it's not necessarily about sweat equity it's about effectiveness oh that's beautiful yes effectiveness um, one, one of the terms that I love is sphere of influence, right? Um, a lot of people equate their tactical skill sets with like being able to, you know, use cucumber or do TDD or whatever it is, right? Uh, being able to create a prototype, whatever it is. And they're like, that's, I'm done. I've checked it off the box. I've contributed at blah, 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 whatever, creative components so my teammates can share repurpose whatever but then they fail to I think the biggest failure that myself and the industry as a whole 
not just every work, like when you're in school, you shadow people, you, you, you go to meetings and you observe them and be a, you know, a fly on the wall, the whole, I do, we do, you do. But I feel that once you get into the work field and into a certain, especially at a certain level, it's like that pairing stops. And when I say on the soft skill parts of it, right? Like facilitating, walking people through your, your mindset, like they do it a lot with your agile methodologies and, and pairing for sure from an engineering side, but then outside of that, engineers talking with designers, with PMs, with stakeholders, with business. Um, and I, I think going back to the sweat equity, equity, it's not the amount of years you've put in. It's not how many things have launched. I think the one piece of advice that I was given as well is people don't remember what you did yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, but dude, my whole resume, I did this, I did this, I did this. They don't remember, right? Um, so it's like, know what motivates you and then apply that to work and home. Is it title? Is it money? Is it work-life balance? And, and between us, I don't know who's done it. If you have, please tell me how you've done it, but rarely can you have it all. So what I've done and I advise people to do is to take a moment to identify and prioritize your motivators, right? Um, and then use that criteria as what you judge your current and future employers and leaders by. To me, that's how you're going to know. Like, personally, I've given up great opportunities at amazing organizations with a lot of sweat put into it and a lot of equity and a lot of long nights. And I had to make a tough decision to just step away from it because I wasn't, things were not meeting the criteria that I set for myself. And a lot of times I think we get caught up in, well, am I good enough versus are they good enough for me? And I'll end it at that. I know that was really cheesy, but <laughs> I go, Catherine, do you want to? <laughs> Catherine's always, I see her laughing at my jokes. So I'm like, okay, go ahead, Catherine. I'll point to you. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think I don't have anything to add to that, Noosh. <laughs> you covered it well. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Kayla or Tia, y'all got any thoughts on that? All of, a lot, a lot of that? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll share one of my, favorite quotes. Um, and it kind of speaks to the comment about effectiveness. Um, and it's, you know, there's, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. Um, and I often see a lot of folks get really just good at just turning out output. Right. But you, you certainly will hit a point where it, it's more important on the outcome. Right. So, you know, don't get don't fall into the trap of, hey, I'm writing more lines of code or I'm, you know, working, you know, 10 hours a day where Mary's only working eight. So I should be promoted. Maybe <laughs> Mary's working eight because she's much more effective. Right. And so getting a better understanding of what the outcome and effectiveness, mm -hmm. um, I think, is just really really important. It's a facet. I don't think we, we maybe talk about enough because we certainly, you know, at, at Home Depot, like I said, had been there a while. It was all about, you know, turning out stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we were turning out all kind of useless stuff, but it was output, right? Hey, we, we delivered, I don't know, hundreds of features. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Did they help our customers? Did it move the needle? Did it solve any of their problems? Did it reduce costs? No, but I delivered 50 of them. And so, you know, it, we really had to change the nature of the conversation because I'd rather have someone who can deliver two transformational things in a quarter versus someone who's delivering 50 just widgets that have questionable value, right? And then as as leaders, right, we need to be able to understand and discern that um, and be able to value um, the impact a lot more than the, the output. Yeah, I think I think on, on that too, I'll just say, I think I make my team sick how many times I say this to them. Every time they're like, I was like, okay, let me get your accomplishments, you know, so we send them in and, and I'm like, For, so what? For the sake of what? What is this? 
Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes we get stuck in the the technology terms too. And so I like to tell them, I'm like, write this in Kayla terms. I don't understand this. Like, tell me, tell me what this is. Why'd we do this thing? And, and they'll take a pause too. You know, it, it's hard to think about the outcome sometimes of something of why we're doing this thing. Well, we said we would, but um, I love that, Tia. And I, I say it almost daily to my team of why, for the sake of what. Um, so, so yeah, I think I thought that that was great. That really resonated with me. I think one little point I kind of want to put on this is just keep a running log of everything you accomplished. And then the biggest thing that you probably aren't doing is make sure you have access to all of the analytics and statistical information so that you know how many users you affected, how much money or revenue you helped generate. What was your contribution to that big pile over there in the corner? How many people were impacted by your work? Um, and how did that drive different initiatives or branding efforts or other things within the company to meet certain goals? Um, it doesn't matter if you, uh, you know, as Tia basically said, if you wrote, you know, 20,000 lines of code in that quarter, if those 20,000 lines of code didn't bring us 50,000 more users, <laughs> right? Like, um, if it brought us five, that we lost money on that, right? Didn't matter how hard you worked on it. So, you know, come in. <laughs> <with> <laughs> So kind of in our final moments here, um, I would love for each person to be able to tell us a little bit about what they're up to and if there's any little final tips and tricks that you want to share with the audience as part of like kind of your, your kind of final status update and where we can find you to learn more. That's a really good point, Stacey. You may have lost her. Hey, guys. Sorry, my internet went out. We have a big storm here in Atlanta. I think it's coming from California. So all you Cali people, thanks. <laughs> no, that, I'm kidding. My plants need it. Um, one... Now we lost her again. Lost you. you can't catch a break on this one. <laughs> I will say for me... Um, just real quick, I I put a couple of one of the things both Tia and oh sorry Noosh. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna type it in here. Y'all go ahead. Are you sure? Okay, am I frozen this time? Hope okay. Third time's a charm. Yeah. Uh, speak to me in Kayla terms, right? One of the things that's probably the biggest thing I've learned becoming a leader, and even prior because I've always I love to talk and I always want to learn like how to talk to other people. I mean, I tried to do sign language when I was a kid. I mean, like, I love talking with people. Um, and one of the things that we've I've done over, like, the first one I took was, like, 20-plus years ago when I started out at autotrader.com. And the most recent one I took here at Kohl's was the a work personality test. Um, we specifically, specifically the ones that I've taken over the course of the years is the one called DISC. Um, and what I love about it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like your horoscope, you know, are, are you a, are you a, a, a Virgo or are you a, a Sagittarius, right? And it gives you hints and tips and tricks on how to communicate with different people. If they're the quiet one, if they're the, you know, fastidious one, if they're, they've got to have every little piece of information documented and they need to consume it, go away and then come back and react. All of those things that really helps with a lot of the questions you guys are having, like, how do I get promoted? All it, ultimately, it all just comes down to communicating, talking with each other. And unfortunately, I've been in the position, and I know this has happened to many people in the past, where you might feel like you're aligned and you're, you're talking the same thing. But then when it comes to review time, or hopefully it shouldn't be a, hopefully if it's done right, it shouldn't be a shock at review time. But 
once you start really talking into it and you, and you define that, oh, what I meant by this is what I'm, what this is, and then there's the unalignment, it's like, it get, it can be very frustrating. So if I say anything, it's just basically, oh, we're at time. Sorry. Go ahead, Stacey. Basically, learn, learn each other's communication style. Go ahead, Stacey. <laughs> Oh, I don't have anything to say. I'm going to pass it off to whoever wants to say anything else. I'll, I'll just add, be kind to yourself and others. This Love has been that. really fun. Thank you. Love that. Yeah, I'll I'll add on something like just super quick. Um, I would just say like the small steps that you're taking now, they compound over time and you never know what they're going to do for your future. Um, speaking of experience, I worked with, with a gentleman six years ago, um, kind of indirectly. And then in March, he calls me and says, you want to be my chief of staff six years later mm -hmm. after I talked to him. So you just never know what you're doing today. That's going to affect, um, the path down the road. So just, just make sure that you're thinking of that and always keeping an open mind. I put a couple things in the chat for you all. One of my favorite quotes is being challenged in life is inevitable. Being defeated is optional. And if you don't know who Roger Crawford is, look him up. Um, really inspiring. Everyone's journey is different. So all of us on the panel, you know, we, we've all gotten to our spots in different ways, which is part of the fun of doing a panel, right? You learn so many different things from different people. Um, build your network. If I could go back and tell myself, you know, at a really young age is value your relationships with people, especially those that you connect with, you know, on LinkedIn or, you know, different jobs, carry those over and then go to a lot of networking events. You never know who you'll meet. You never know what jobs will come out of it. Not that that's, you know, your, your main purpose, yeah, it's like Stacy and I connected. She was a judge for a hackathon at FedEx that we did. Um, so you net, and that was years ago. So it, you just never know. Back to what Kayla is saying: be humble, mm -hmm. but don't be a doormat. You know, know your worth and be patient. Know when to stay and know when to run away. <laughs> know when to fall. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So those are just some things I've learned. In would love to connect with anybody um, offline. If, if you want to talk more, you want to hear more, happy to just like, I'm sure everybody on the panel would be. Awesome. And then the only thing I would say is, um, you know, stay true to who you are. Um, really invest that time to find your voice. Um, it's, it's worth doing, you know, good looks like a lot of different ways. Um, and so you don't have to change who you are, um, to fit some kind of mold. Uh, you just got to figure out how to let yourself shine and really cultivate who you are. That's really important. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that, that sentiment because there's always a place for you somewhere and not where like it may have been your place at that place but maybe it's no longer <laughs> where you your place right um we all grow organizations change and you know it's kind of you have to be the executive of your own career yeah it's, it's right? not oh no continue continue I keep pausing. Am I dead? No, we can hear you. We hear you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I think going back to like looking back in your career, my biggest thing is that learn, learn to help separate work from home. Um, there's, it's really hard for people who are, some people can, my husband, five o'clock, He's not even thinking about what his boss said or any of his coworkers. I'm 12 o'clock at night trying to go to bed and I'm like, oh my God, why did he say that? Or why did she say that? And it's like, just really learn to like 
you spend half your life there, half more, more hours in a day than there is daytime at work. So just really be true to yourself, like Tia said, and figure out who you are and what you stand for, and then find a company, an organization, and a leader that, that reflects some of those criteria. Thank you. I love this. This was fun. Sorry I was late. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending the our monthly mentor panel, How to Get Promoted, and thank you to our esteemed panelists.